I believe we are live here. All right, well, welcome everybody, and thank you for taking time this afternoon. Um, uh, real quick, before we get into it, a uh, quick run of show here. Um, we've got a full slate for you today. Uh, we'll start off with um, about five minutes of opening remarks from uh, FERC Commissioner Allison Clements, and then we'll dive into um, a structured panel discussion for about a minute, hopefully left over um, for Q&A from the audience. So feel free just to put it in the in the box, and then I'll go ahead and, and screen your uh, questions and, and um, ask that uh, for the panel. So um, to jump right in here, uh, we uh, have almost 200 registrants right now. I think that's a pretty clear indication that people are pretty interested in the topic of transmission policy reform. And that really comes as little surprise. Um, transmission policy is really at the intersection of economic development, energy innovation, and the clean transition. And right now there's pervasive inadequacies in existing transmission policy. And that's causing a variety of issues, everything from billions in avoidable cost increases to um, leaving reliability risks exposed, stifling innovation, and suppressing uh, clean energy access. And so independent experts and consumer groups in particular have become increasingly vocal on the heart of the matter and really trying to revise a system that right now is favorable primarily to one set of stakeholder interests, um, and that's incumbent transmission owners, whereas a lot of other stakeholder interests are starting to organize and vocalize their concerns about uh, the current state of play and why extensive reform is needed to sort of level the regulatory playing field between transmission suppliers while ensuring fairness uh, to consumer interests. So at this stage, it's you could make a fair argument, I think, that transmission reform is arguably the most important national energy policy issue. Congress is taking aim of this, and it certainly is a top, if not the top, priority at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And on that, we're very fortunate today to be joined by FERC Commissioner Allison Clements, who's perhaps the most knowledgeable and influential person on transmission policy in the country right now. <laughs> um, welcome, Commissioner. And after, um, after her opening remarks, we'll have a panel discussion with Ari Pesco, who is the director of the Electricity Law Initiative at the Harvard Law School, um, Cindy Bogorod, who's the attorney for the Transmission Access Policy Study Group, uh, or TAPS, which represents uh, transmission-dependent utilities, as well as uh, Keith Collins, who's the executive director of market monitoring for the Southwest Power Pool or SPP. Uh, and for those who don't know, SPP is generally the, the Great Plains region of the, of the country, which is a very interesting case study on transmission policy. Um, unfortunately, Paul Sissio will not be able to join us today. Um, he's the president and CEO of the Industrial Energy Consumers of America, um, but he has asked that I sort of parrot his talking points in his place. So I will at times be jumping in here as a surrogate for the industrial consumers, uh, as well as the coalition that Paul is helping to lead on transmission competition. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Commissioner Clements. Thanks, Devin. Uh, it's nice to see you and it's great to have the chance to be with this A-list panel. Um, this is the best kind of comments for a uh, commissioner, which is to say hello, introduce a topic and then get out of the way and let the actual experts uh, have the conversation. So I'm a fan of our street. I think your organization um, provides a really important voice in the dialogue on issues related to the energy transition. And I know under your leadership that is continuing uh, on, on the electricity front. So thank you for that contribution. Uh, it transmission's cool again. There are a small group of people in the universe whose hearts are just growing out of their chests because finally the moment has come for all of us who've been thinking about these issues for a long time that there is an, a national recognition, um, a regional recognition, a local recognition that we're at a moment where we need significant investment in the transmission system. This is not a FERC only effort. If we want to succeed in the dual effort of both building sufficient transmission to support what we view as the US modern economy. If we want to continue to play that role in the world, our transmission system has to back up that economy. 
And the other part of that is, and protect customers along the way. All parts of government and industry and stakeholders need to have buy-in that we have a credible process by which transmission gets developed, as well as credible role for states to weigh in on what transmission gets developed, all the way down to individual communities and landowners who are going to have to host uh, a lot of this transmission investment. So Congress has been talking about transmission. There's a lot of important um, provisions contained in the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, some of which are relevant to the commission. And you may in fact get into the siting conversation and the backstop siting conversation, although I know uh, a lot of the focus today might be on some of the competition issues um, uh, in particular. And so when I come to what is FERC's role in all of this, you mentioned a broad um, record that the commission has developed over the last year in an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, which that's really everything we could think of about transmission policy and potential need for reform. And are grateful to all of you who have engaged and provided records in that comment. And because I'm gonna hand it off, I'll, I'll skip right to the heart of the matter, which is an issue of importance to all of you. And that is competition in the development of new transmission. And we are considering that issue in real time at the commission right now, as you have all, all are. That's why this is such a timely conversation. I've heard both sides. Well, I've heard all sides of the, of, of the globe, if you will. Uh, you know, I've heard that competition works for customers. In some places we've seen the proof is in the pudding where there are lower cost investments made by competitive transmission providers to the benefit of customers. I've also heard perspectives and see in the record perspectives where the introduction of competition into the regional training process has been the biggest barrier to getting sufficient investment done. Uh, and so how do we think nationally or on a region by region basis, how do we contain costs? How do we provide the competitive forces on behalf of customers as we pursue significant investment in new transmission? And that's hopefully the conversation you are going to tee up today. Um, I really look forward to listening in. And, and thanks again, Devin, for the chance to participate. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for those, those opening remarks. And I think that's a great segue to um, the conversation that we're going to have here, which is going to start off with a, a first round here that's a little bit more landscape um, focused on transmission policy. And then we're going to start digging in um, to some, some very particular elements. So first off, I've um, got a, the, the initial question here going to Ari. Ari, I've got a very simple question for you that you can answer in 30 seconds. Um, could you please provide us with uh, a brief history of transmission policy, the current state of affairs, and just generally its implications, as well as how you see different stakeholder interests being advantaged or disadvantaged under the, the current set of conditions? I'm going to try to answer at least most of those questions, and I'm going to try to do it in about three minutes. So I hope that's okay, maybe four. Um, but first, let me just start with like um, why transmission matters. So of course, transmission physically connects power plants to local networks that deliver power to consumers, but it's a lot more than that. Um, it's the medium that facilitates short-term and long-term coordination in the industry. In the short term, operational decisions by the transmission operator determine who produces power and how much they produce. And over the long term, decisions about where to build new transmission opens opportunities for new sources of power. So really control over transmission is in a lot of ways control over the industry. Um, so getting to the historical aspect of this. So in 1935, Congress gave FERC authority over interstate transmission and gave it basically two main tasks. One, encourage utilities to coordinate to improve efficiency of the industry. And two, ensure that any coordination was just and reasonable and not unduly discriminatory. So until the 1990s, uh, FERC's general approach was to prioritize utility coordination and overlook systemic anti-competitive effects of that coordination. So in many parts of the country, utilities essentially combine their state granted local monopolies into largely unregulated regional cartels that dominated power sector infrastructure development. By the 1990s, the economics of the industry changed and power for decades had gotten cheaper, but that was no longer the case. And FERC sought to harness competition to improve industry performance, but it recognized that utility control over transmission was an obstacle and that monopolist utilities would act in their self-interest to thwart competition unless restrained by regulation. So FERC changed its approach 
The key move that it made was for the first time, it set minimum terms and conditions for transmission service. Utilities had to provide comparable service uh, to everyone. And that was supposed to enable new entry into the wholesale uh, market. But FERC quickly realized that these rules were difficult to police. Uh, so what it did was it encouraged utilities to join regional transmission organizations or RTOs, which would operate the network independently of any utility or other market participant. And FERC also charged these RTOs with planning regional transmission expansion. So separating ownership of transmission from its control was a revolutionary move, uh, but because membership in these RTOs is voluntary, RTOs have to in some ways cater to the needs of their members and their most important members are their transmission owning utilities. So the uh, issue that's really now on, on the table that, that Commissioner Clements teed up is long-term transmission planning. Um, transmission planning determines which projects are paid for through cost of service transmission rates. Um, outside of RTOs, regional planning is largely non-existent. So on that score, RTO planning is superior to what utilities are doing outside of RTOs. Prior to 2014, RTOs were explicitly still cartels for the purpose of transmission development. That is, utilities built all of the projects planned by the RTO and were the key actors in the planning process. And naturally, utilities would not want the RTO to plan projects that would harm its own uh, interests. So 2014 is about the time when RTOs and as well as utilities outside of RTOs had to comply with Order 1000. Uh, which attempted to end the transmission cartels by requiring competitive development for certain types of regional projects. So this ended what were called rights of first refusal that were baked into RTO, some of the RTO tariffs, or actually I should say the, the multi-state RTO tariffs. Uh, but this created an obvious incentive for utilities to prioritize projects they could build outside of that competitive mandate. That was some regional projects, as well as local projects, those contained within a utility's own retail uh, service territory. And so indeed, since that time, we've seen regional spending decrease in the multi-state RTOs and even disappear uh, in some regions. And in multi-state RTOs, competition is basically non-existent. Um, in the past few years, um, as utilities have spent uh, almost exclusively on local projects. So the challenge before FERC, um, there are several challenges. One, how can you motivate more spending on regional projects, including projects that are broadly beneficial, but that may harm utility interests by, for example, facilitating new entry in power generation, particularly in many regions of the country where utilities are still the dominant generation owners. Um, how can FERC ensure the industry is building transmission that aligns with future needs and that incorporates innovative technologies? Um, is competition viable or will utilities always be able to avoid competition to the detriment of regional coordination? And, and related to all this, how do regional projects with broad benefits get paid for? Who pays for them and how much do they pay for them is another issue that's been teed up uh, in this big uh, rulemaking process that, that FERC has undertaken. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Ari. That was a whirlwind and that was fantastic. Uh, for everyone, there'll be a, a prize if you can answer the quiz at the end of this based on, uh, on Ari's uh, three minute lecture there. Thank you, Ari. Uh, I'm gonna turn the next question over to, to Cindy. Uh, Cindy, how do transmission dependent utilities view the current state of transmission policy? And I'd be really interested to also learn more about one particular issue of why certain communities tend to receive a higher quality level of transmission service um, than others. Thanks. Um, thanks, Diavan. I think um, as transmission dependent utilities, we definitely have a um, ringside seat for the flaws in the current um, transmission landscape. Um, um, we're facing steeply increased transmission costs, even though we haven't yet started the, the real buildup that people are anticipating um, will be needed. Um, I can just note a couple of anecdotes that um, the, the, there's been a one year um, um, network service rating increase of 37 and 50% in two zones in SPP. It's the um, Empire District and KCPNL zone. 
There have been, we've seen significant rate increases for a number of PJM TOs in recent years, ranging up to 85% over um, the period since um, 2018. And PG&E's capital um, expenditures have almost doubled in, in the past five years. And th this last year, their transmission revenue requirement increased by 30%. And that's before we're getting started on what the, the ANOPA is um, focused on. Um, and I, I think a big concern, you know, getting towards um, De Devin's more specific question is um, th that, you know, a, a concern that transmission planning and expansion is not meeting the, the needs of load serving entities, which is what um, Federal Power Act section 217b4 commands. And um, one thing our guys have noticed is that re re renewables, even if they're supported by network resource integration service and our designated network re resources are being di dispatched down. Um, the, the RTOs are not planning for the continued um, the deliverability of resources to load. And then, and then a number of TDUs are, are, are subject to unreliable service. In contrast to a TO's own load, um, a 50 megawatt TDU can be limited to a single radial connection to the grid. So anytime there's a big storm, there are, you know, customers all lose power. Um, and, and that just is, is not the way the TO would be doing it it's, itself. Um, but unfortunately, the TOs have no incentive to, to actually improve the service or re reliability of their com competitor, T TDU. So um, who have little or n nothing to say, you know, influence over the the planning process. And TDUs, um, transmission depending utilities have largely been excluded from grid ownership. Joint ownership opportunities have been few and far between. A re recent proposal to enhance the TDU role in planning and expansion was re rejected by FERC as inconsistent with o o Order 890. Um, the bottom line is we're not getting the more cost-effective and efficient transmission expansion that Order, 8, Order 1000 was seeking to promote. And, um, you know, as, as Ari was alluding to, and, and non-RTO regions, they just seem not to have gotten the memo with regard to Order 1000. We submitted as part of our comments, pretty detailed critique of what was going on or not going on in Florida. And there was no rebuttal in any of the reply comments, which I think is quite telling. Um, and building significant generation, building significant upgrades in the generator interconnection process where it's typically not necessarily, or it's, it's not necessarily right size, and it's evading the, the order 890 and, and order 1000 planning process is not gonna get it right either. Um, and and that despite the, ob the obligation to consider non-transmission um, alternative, grid enhancing technologies are, are not being heavily considered in the planning process. And so we're losing opportunities to make better use of the existing grid as well as new additions. And I could go on, but um, <laughs> in, 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 in the interest of not, not hogging, I'll just sum by saying reform is definitely necessary. Although as Ari was alluding to, crafting those reforms is no easy feat. Um, so, um, and I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks, Cindy. I think that put a, a real finer point on the nature of a lot of uh, challenges that we face today and actually really needing to zero in on the problem statement and talk about the appropriate tailored solutions here. 
um, to get a little bit more like um, uh, the voice of an independent um, monitor um, for one of the particular regional systems here, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Keith for, for his assessment on transmission planning and procurement processes today, how they're performing. And um, in particular, SPP made some headlines a few months ago for its recent um, competitive transmission solicitation, which got a lot of us interested in the field. Um, so Keith. All right, thank you, um, Devin. And I wanna thank you and the R Street for inviting me today to, to make some comments. Um, and so I think the way to describe the, uh, my assessment of the transmission planning process is it's, it's really near-term focused. Um, essentially, transmission owners are wanting to solve uh, phase congestion uh, on the system. Um, and um, really, uh, if they can get others to help pay for that, uh, this can help reduce their congestion exposure. Um, unfortunately, what we're seeing is that, you know, given this increase of, of, of new generation on the system, that congestion patterns are shifting and likely to continue to shift in ways that we don't really understand just yet. Um, a real key issue that, that the transmission owners are, are noting today is that they're concerned is that, um, that the new generation, uh, merchant generation, typically renewable, um, is, uh, is going to free ride on the process in that they, they're, uh, to the extent that there is um, uh, transmission planning, that ultimately that costs that they believe should be in the generation interconnection process are likely going to find its way into, um, into the process, uh, into the transmission planning process that uh, may require an NTC or, or, or the notice to construct. So, um, so really, I think our concern is that you're not really accounting for the realistic changes in the system. And so uh, you're, you're not really uh, planning for the generation of the future necessarily, but you're building transmission uh, for an alternate grid uh, that will not, not likely materialize. Um, uh, and, and the RTO's transmission planning process produces outfits, outputs sorry, that are uh, significantly in, influenced by transmission owners, uh, um, and then from this process, they can go to the regulators and say that um, that the uh, that the outputs were produced by uh, an independent process that was run by the RTO. However, it's those <coughs> transmission owning uh, entities that actually have a great influence on the inputs of the process that affect that. Now, with respect to the uh, competitive process, this was actually a very interesting uh, result uh, this past fall that, that Devin was alluded to. Um, there was a competitive proposal for the Wolf Creek to Blackberry. Uh, it was a 345 kV uh, line. And ultimately, the SBP process is uh, there are um, uh, proposals submitted by entities. Uh, these proposals are reviewed by a panel of independent uh, industry experts uh, that have primarily engineering expertise, um, and they evaluate the proposal. And so it was interesting in this, this, uh, in this case, um, uh, the winning proposal uh, was actually not an incumbent uh, transmission owner. It was actually Nextera Energy uh, Transmission that won. And what was also very interesting was that uh, the costs associated with this project um, from a build perspective were 27% lower than the next lowest cost. So substantially, substantial amount of cost savings. And then if you look at the life of the maintenance and operations over a 40 year period, it was 30% lower cost. And so um, this is something that was very interesting that we had not seen come through this process before, um, but definitely something that can, can affect rate payers in a very positive way. And so what was interesting as, and as, as the market monitor, sometimes we, we hear grumblings of, of concerns. And one of the things that came up was, was that potentially uh, uh, Next Era, or the entity that, that won the bid, um, which they found out to be Next Era, had had somehow manipulated the numbers in a way. And and what was interesting um, is that, as as far as we understand, um, uh, that uh, having not validated the numbers, but what we understand is that this particular entity did have relationships with vendors and economies of scale that they were able to pass along in their in the competitive process. So we see this as a very um, this particular process is one that, that worked very well uh, this past year. So again, thank you for having me and I look forward to answering uh, as the discussion and answering questions as part of this panel. Thanks.
Thanks, Keith. I think that's a, that's a great little microcosm of, of today's discussion here. Um, and, and in the absence of Paul here, um, I'm going to put on my industrial consumer hat. And then also we've um, been reaching out and having um, off the record conversations with a lot of transmission consumer groups in recent months. So I'll kind of delineate a lot of where, where, where that uh, conversation has been going. So first off, just to, to, from an industrial um, perspective, typically industrial consumers are really motivated in this space by two things, cost and reliability. And in the last few years, I'll also add that we've seen a little bit more of the corporate sustainability movement really influencing also the industrial um, segment too. So certainly having access to more options on the, um, the sourcing side of energy has been really um, of, of, of interest to a lot of these companies as of late. And so when you just kind of put that cost and reliability lens on, I think it speaks for itself based on what our panelists have already said here of why um, energy intensive industry is really concerned about like the current state of transmission policy and where it's going. So first off, a lot of them have looked at um, where the, the cost trends have been going and they've seen you know, a doubling in recent years and a lot of footprints of the transmission portion of their bill. Um, and in years prior to that, it also doubled. <laughs> so the last decade, you've seen a lot of upward pressure on transmission costs. Some of this comes with benefits that outweigh those costs in some cases, clearly. But what we do see is a very evident case of a, a lack, a severe lack of cost discipline. At the same time, since Order 1000 that Ari referenced has been implemented, we have a little under a decade of experience with elements of where competition has been enacted, like the one Keith mentioned. And by and large, a lot of that community looks at this and looks at where we've seen experiences with it and where competition has actually come out. And they're looking at 20 to 40 percent cost savings as a pretty common range. And in fact, a lot of independent studies are, are, are uh, confirming that overall. Um, and so that's obviously got that crew very interested. And when a lot of the um, transmission consumer groups started to talk about going into the, the FERC ANOPER that you're hearing about, where is the issue alignment? Well, under Paul's leadership, he was able to reach out to a whole variety of consumer advocates, state industrial groups, national consumer advocates, and a bunch of groups. And they said, what are some issues we can coalesce around? competition was right front and center um, in, the, in that response bit. And so that's why you saw a strong emphasis from that coalition around that topic. Um, but also some of the issues that I think our panelists noted with concerns over the independence of transmission planning and that incumbents tend to kind of cook some of the numbers on the input side is, is a real uh, concern of theirs. So more independence and transparency is big. And then sort of as, as Cindy was alluding to, there are transmission planning processes that occur outside of regional transmission organizations, such as SPP. And a lot of the transparency stuff there in their views is, has been far worse. And so a lot of them want to see competitive processes used both within the RTO regions as well as outside of them. And that way the incumbent transmission owners who are voluntarily members of RTOs, as Ari pointed out, um, don't have the opportunity to sort of arbitrage um, between the membership and, and pick some of the structures, but rather levelize um, some of the, the regulatory treatment between those areas um, and really go after the competitive carve outs under Order 1000, which is why we've only seen um, roughly 3% of transmission projects that could be subject to competition actually are. Um, and that gets around to the issue of why you see a lot of regulatory evasion, where you see um, uh, transmission projects going through to, to, to um, elements like a lot of local project development instead of like a, a regional project development that would be more efficient. And so that current stranglehold that incumbents have on the ability to help navigate transmission process selection can really be addressed through a, a more independent and transparent planning process that is inclusive of all stakeholders up front in the process which also helps address some siting issues right downstream, which is something that we'll talk about as being a big um, issue with a lot of transmission development in the country. So I think that kind of captures where a lot of the sentiment is of especially like the energy intensive um, folks. And now maybe we can dig into uh, some more particular details um, um, with our panel. So Ari, what in your view has been sort of like the, the root cause of a lot of the 
um, underperformance of order 1000. And in particular, we're hearing a lot of questions about should the thesis of 1000, right? Competition between suppliers, competition between technologies, right? Um, should that be something that sticks going forward? Or is it is that what's the issue, or is it the implementation of that thesis that has been the the problem? I, I mean, I think um, competition is is good. Um, I think um, this is the right audience to say that. Um, but all, but you know, I think the main you know one of the main reasons why competition is important is because we need innovation in this sector. Um, you know, the power generation mix is shifting regardless of, of your thoughts about how, how quickly or how far that should shift, it's undoubtedly shifting. Um, we have new transmission technologies that are available to make the system more efficient, but the current rate making paradigm rewards capital deployment, not efficiency. And so there's, we're just trying to, you know, FERC has a separate proceeding right now about how to kind of address that issue, but there's a real fundamental disconnect between what we can do and what the incentives are. Um, so competition can, can, in theory, should be able to address some of those issues without recreating the whole uh, rate making system. Um, and you know, there's there, you know, there's no reason to think that utilities are best equipped to plan the grid of the future. They certainly are capable of it, but there's no reason to think they're the best at it. Um, and so we need to get more voices in the room that are technically capable of both thinking through what the grid should look like and actually pulling off these projects. And there certainly are companies that are willing, willing to do that. Um, so I think the, the thesis is correct. You know, one solution that I've put forward as to how to make competition work is to actually subject the utility planned investments, these local projects where all the dollars are flowing to these days to subject those investments to greater scrutiny. Um, you know, one, one reason it's attractive for utilities to invest in their local service territories because there's almost no oversight in, in many states, either by state regulators uh, or by FERC. It's just essentially a pass-through cost that gets no scrutiny. So maybe by bringing greater scrutiny to some of these um, local investments, the, one that's in, the, the ones that Cindy was saying were just leading to these massive uh, rate increases for some of these transmission-dependent utilities, maybe that'll, that'll bring some more momentum to the regional uh, processes by sort of removing this sort of safe haven uh, for for utility investments, but you know utilities are always going to be powerful players uh, in transmission development, um, and as long as there's we sort of have this voluntary regime where utilities can decide whether or not to join these regional organizations, it's going to be tough to create a truly independent planning process that's really looking out for system-wide benefits and not worrying about the parochial interests of the utility members. Well said. <laughs> um, Cindy, I'm going to turn it over to you to elaborate on one of the points you made. You, you talked about um, transmission customers wanting to get more involved in the, the planning process. So how do we get have a more inclusive process um, especially for transmission dependent utilities, but perhaps even you know broader with consumers um, in sort of the transmission expansion conversation and planning process. Um, well, the, 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 Devin, what TAPS has long been pushing for and what the commission has actually said good things about over the, the, the many years is joint ownership of transmission transmission with TDUs. And um, our view is that inclusive joint ownership by TDUs and the, the relevant footprint would spur inclusion of TDUs in the planning process in a meaningful way, help get needed transmission built and re reduce costs to consumers. So that's, and it has other benefits too, but um, I'll, I'll skip those for the moment, but I'll just focus on a few, you know, Inclusive joint ownership would actually make joint planning real. And, and we've seen it happen where it has happened is that seating TDUs at the grown up table um, better ensures that their needs get met when they're doing local planning. Um, and, and so it eliminates the Swiss cheese problem where parts of the grid just get left out. Um, it also can be a big plus in terms of getting sighting of major transmission, um, which is what we you know, seem to be moving towards, is um, 
you know, TDUs, even if they're just a small percentage of, of, of the footprint and, uh, or of ownership, would bring a wealth of political support to the state approval process. And this support can make all the difference in getting it through quickly and without much controversy. And we've seen the benefits of that in the um, CapEx 2020 projects, which became, most of which are, are MISO um, MVPs, multi value projects. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it really significantly helped them get through. The other thing which the commission itself has commented on favorably in the 2012 incentive policy statement is that it spreads the financial risk of major projects broadly and, and was identified there as a risk reducing measure um, those seeking incentives should consist to header before putting their hand out. Um, and, and it also benefits um, con consumers. Public power is, is not subject to income taxes and they flow the sac, um, tax saving to rate payers, their debt costs are lower. And, and even when there's a hypothetical capital structure, public powers, capital structures are commonly include less equity than the investor owns. So um, what TAPS did in its comments is we've proposed several alternatives to promote inclusive joint ownership. Um, one is to, 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 to make such arrangements a factor in selection of regional and interregional projects. Another is to afford greater flexibility to those planning processes that, 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 that do ensure meaningful opportunities for inclusive joint ownership. Another is to provide meaningful opportunities for TDU joint ownership as a feature of an improved local planning process. Um, and finally, the, the, the other thing we suggest is providing, out, providing for bidding at the cost of construction um, and capital requirements of regional and interregional projects with the bidding structure to provide an opportunity for TDUs to participate. So, I mean, and, and that's not the only ways that can be done, but it, it, you know, if the object is to build the, the grid we need as um, Commissioner Clements was, was pointing out in a way that is cost effective and um, you know, keeps both objects in mind, I think TDU joint ownership is a very important step um, in that process. Thanks, Cindy. That's really helpful, and, and I appreciate sort of that the, the focus on the Swiss cheese problem, which I think goes uh, overlooked a lot. Um, we both are the future of transmission policy is very much a, uh, a a macro big project conversation, as well as the what's going on down at the local level question, exactly. right? And so we we have to make sure we figure out that we have policies and in our institutions that are aligned to make sure that you have like a consistent degree of economic scrutiny throughout that process and, and competitive forces kind of injected in that with the ability for consumer voices to come out. So thanks for kind of um, delineating that. And uh, I'll turn it over to Keith here. So, so Keith, you, would, uh, you, know, you had mentioned that maybe certain entities play different roles in SPP's transmission planning process. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on that and how it affects outcomes. And then also talk about uh, especially your role um, in terms of providing oversight just on transmission processes, not the operation of energy markets, which is clearly something all market monitors really do well. But what is your role with transmission oversight in SPP? And maybe what's your sense of how that compares to how market monitors do it in, in other footprints? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Devin. Um, I think the the thing that that's interesting about SPP and uh, all RTOs have have different governance structures, and in the SBP model, it's it's uh, it's member driven, uh, even more th so than participant driven. And the members sit on committees, and there is a transmission planning committee, and um, uh, that particular committee is made mostly of um, transmission own transmission owning entities, and um, what they're doing is they are. Uh, designing um, the process that the RTO will follow uh, by 
by informing the RTO of the structure of the plan and um, informing and shaping how inputs are created. And so uh, while entities that are not transmission owners have the ability to provide insights, um, most of them do not have a, a vote, particularly on the committee that does the formation of, of the policy. Now, SPP does have other committees that, that review and approve, but um, it's important to understand that uh, the, the structure that, that SPP has does tend to favor the transmission owners in the process. Um, and ultimately, what we see are, are instances where some of these inputs are shaped not because they are, uh, in fact, reflective of uh, the, the actual value, uh, but they're done so to influence the process. And a quick example is uh, there was a, a number associated with uh, variable operations and maintenance costs for wind, um, and participants wanted some set of participants wanted that number to be uh, uh, a higher number uh, than what the RTO was proposing, and and in fact they were able to to vote that number through. Um, uh, thankfully, as as uh, as we the RTO and others uh, were able to convince that uh, that number was actually not reflective of what uh, these costs are for wind resources, but but again, this was done in an attempt to um, create an outcome that was consistent with, with what uh, folks wanted to see in the process. And so this type of input modifications are, are things that we see. Um, and, and in particular, that's where we as the market monitor are most engaged in, I think, in the process is, is to, to look at um, in the transmission development process for planning, um, how can we um, evaluate given our market knowledge and bring that to bear in the transmission planning process. And so your inputs are consistent with what we're seeing operationally. And so it's helping to bridge that gap between the operational side and the planning side to ensure that, um, uh, that there's some consistency and that we can root out some of these sort of interests that may creep in that are designed to try to influence the process in a particular way to create an outcome. And so we do spend a lot of time uh, engaged in that process. And so that's something that we have not always been engaged with and not all market monitors are engaged with. I, I had the, uh, the experience of working with the Cali California ISO market monitor and in my time there, we did not, uh, we did not devote any time um, to transmission planning and that was consistent with the SPP market monitor uh, before, I, uh, before I came on board. So it is not common um, uh, that all RTO market monitors are engaged in this process. Uh, I think from our perspective, um, one of the things that's important to our scope of work is, uh, is congestion, right? So anything that affects congestion becomes important. And for us, transmission planning is a very important part of the process for ensuring that congestion outcomes operationally um, are, 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 are working consistently together with the planning process and the operation process. So that's really how we've gotten involved. I think our biggest limiting factor is, is, is staffing. Um, and this is not a, as you sort of noted, we have a primary focus, which is monitoring markets and, and looking at those things. Um, uh, we have, as I said, gotten engaged on the transmission planning side, but we are not as engaged, for instance, in oversight of the competitive, uh, uh, the competitive process. We do not have a formal role in that process. Uh, we haven't been looking at the generation interconnection queue process, for instance. And so there's definitely plenty of areas for us to uh, 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 further, uh, uh, further exploration. But I think at this time, what holds us back is that it's not considered a primary function of the market monitor. And so we, we monitor what we can and provide insights. And my sense is that other market monitors, um, it's, it varies. Some of them will do less, some of them about the same as us, and, and some of them, as, as I understand, perhaps with uh, Joe Bowering and monitoring analytics might do a bit more. So it's uneven. And I think part of that also gets to, you know, the scope, uh, what's considered the primary scope for market monitor and uh, how that may be interpreted, and then the staffing and, and the budgeting that goes along with it. So thanks, Devin. Yeah, thanks, Keith. And I think you raised a great point about things being uneven. And I think 
as FERC is deciding its reforms going forward, you look at kind of the record that's been built up there. One of the things that kind of just stands out right off the bat is how much variation there is in how transmission practices are used between regions, how much variation there is between regions, but also between different levels and types of transmission investment. So this is a big and interesting thing because we've seen very different results um, in different regions, right? I think New England's maybe had one competitive solicitation, for example, um, whereas the competitive carve-outs haven't been as pervasive and it's been pushed more in, a, in an area like uh, Kaiso in California's pushed it. And so you've seen more there, whereas you've seen other areas where the market monitor is more robustly involved in providing oversight, which helps provide a, a stronger voice for independent inputs in the planning process. In other areas, some of your your uh, your counterparts, Keith, in other regions have been pretty clear, like we don't really know that this is our function whatsoever. It's pretty unclear. And so FERC has uh, thrown the idea out there about an independent transmission monitor concept. And that would not just be something that applies in an RTO like SPP, but potentially it could be done outside of those areas. So you see just a lot of uneven treatment. And that might be an interesting theme as I you know, channel my, my surrogate role here with the industrial consumers is that I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from the disparate implementation of Order 1000 right now. And when you start to piece that together and you take away some of the regulatory evasion opportunities, <laughs> um, then you start to piece together an opportunity to have a much better and higher performing system that has independent planning and oversight, is much more transparent, has much more state at all stakeholder inclusive processes, um, right from really top to bottom, regional, interregional planning down to like local processes, um, like Cindy was talking about. And um, and I know something that Paul was really interested in was going after uh, not just the technical carve outs under order 1000 and to avoid the weeds, those are things like voltage thresholds, which again, um, vary by region in terms of how they interpret that and define it, but also the eligibility, what product or what type of projects qualify for competitive solicitations, which ones don't, it varies by region right now. And so that gives you a clear a difference in outcomes right now. But also the big rise I know that's, um, that's uh, confronting a lot of folks is that while Order 1000 eliminated the federal right of first refusal, um, in, as, in doing so, it left open the opportunity for states to pass a state grofer. And that's what we've seen really take hold in recent years, especially in a lot of the Midwest, center parts of the country. And so the, the big challenge there is that um, states are passing laws for uh, that are inhibiting competition for regional transmission projects, which are inherently interstate in nature. And so naturally, there's going to be a bit of a tension here. And you've seen everyone from the Department of Justice expressing interest in this, um, not just the competitive interests of FERC, but also um, when we've looked at a lot of these state interests, uh, I think one important thing to note is that states have a right to enact bad policy, right? If it only affects their state. But what we're seeing with state rofers is that out-of-state interests are taking legal action against another state's rofer. That tells you something. And now that we're starting to see the next round of regional projects come out and those costs are being regionally allocated, in a footprint like the Midwest, you're starting to see resistance to um, that, that cost allocation because one state's interests are really concerned about the cost increases from another state's rofer, which naturally leads you to the question of, do we talk about a role of FERC in either preemption or another type of role um, in terms of, um, you know, just revisiting the presumption of prudence in projects that are not subject to competitive solicitations, right, or maybe some combination therein. So I think that's going to be a real hot topic on the future of, of transmission policy. Um, but with that, I will um, look over to our questions uh, here. One Can I just make a real quick follow-up comment to what Keith was saying? I just want to highlight that the example he gave of sort of the window and M cost, I think really highlights how hard the task is for FERC, right? Where you have this sort of lower level committee making this input into the planning process and how it can uh, sort of mess things up. Um, you know, FERC doesn't have the capacity to police all of this. Um, and so, you know, one of the calls in the ANOPER proceeding is we need more inputs into the planning process. Um, and I think that's that's really important. It's it's integral to actually getting planning right, but it also presents all these opportunities for intentionally getting these inputs wrong uh, for the 
parochial interests of those in charge of the planning process. Yeah, that's a good point. And actually, I think, Ari, that might even kind of answer the last question that came in here from the audience to some degree. So there's a, to, to restate this for everyone, you know, one of the arguments that, that this person had heard against uh, competitive transmission is that if you let more companies into the game, then you're going to start to see like a lot of, you know, um, identifying needs in that planning process that may not be legitimate. So that gets back even to the point of having the importance of having an independent transmission planning process where you have some internal controls in place where other stakeholders, especially consumers, can come in and, and market monitors can kind of come in and help discipline that process. But also a big thing that's important to note, I think, is, um, and I'd love our panelists to weigh in here, is there's a lot more question right now about how grid resilience and some other factors like go in, creep into transmission planning. And right now there's a lot of questions about what sort of the cost benefit of these different criteria, who's defining it, um, and, and so there's a lot of interest in making sure that there's um, going to be an independent like arbiter of what those inputs are to make sure, A, that we're doing, you know, planning for the system that's most likely in the future and not sort of just doing something that responds to parochial <laughs> interests of some kind. I'd be curious to, to hear more about um, from our panel on that. I, well, I can jump in here, um, and, please. Sorry. and I think um, really from our perspective, we would think that having a wider set of interests uh, would actually be beneficial. I think what we tend to see is the same set of interests or very similar interests making some decisions or, or under either understanding elements within a small sphere, um, but not really understanding the possibilities of a wider sphere. So I think we would we would definitely welcome uh, welcome that as, as more voices are in the process, we would anticipate that you'd get a wider range of uh, ideas and, and thoughts about how that may, uh, how, how the, the, the piece gets put together. And I think, as I said, I think in some of my earlier comments is that what we're seeing instead is we focus on the very near term, right? Is to say, well, I don't know what the future is gonna be, so I'm gonna solve today's congestion. But that's really not planning and, and, and preparing yourself um, for the congestion of the future. And I think it's those ideas and thoughts about what, uh, what it might be to solve that, but also in terms of what that might look like. And so I think in a wider range of, of ideas in that process would be helpful. Um, I, I'll just echo that and say that, you know, it's, it's not having more people at the table that are going to cause um, things to go awry. It's having fewer people in the back room um, where, where the imports, you know, make their way in, as Keith was suggesting. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the, you know, the, 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 there certainly are challenges with the state rofers um, and what the best way to deal with them while the commission is also trying to work with states is an interesting philosophical question. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, having some sort of independent oversight, and I, I really am very interested to hear what you've been doing at SPP, because I think that may well sort of put a spotlight on the role that an independent transmission monitor or expansion of the role of the IMMs in RTOs can take on and um, influence the process and, and make sure we're not getting um, de detoured by bad inputs. Yeah, that's that's a great point, Cindy. And, um, you know, to put one bit, bit on there in the, the state roper thing, I think it would be uh, interesting to, to encourage more conversations with state public utility commissions which from California to the Northeast, um, we're, we're pretty clear on the FERC record that competition is a good thing, but a little bit lighter on and the exact mechanism for doing that for probably some obvious reasons. Um, but also I think one of the best set of comments came from the, the Kentucky, the chairman of the Kentucky commission, right? He said, we need to see fewer rofers and more competition. A simple path forward maybe for FERC is to sit there and, and, and sit down with some of the state leaders and say, we hear you loud and clear, the proof is in the pudding, it's obvious, but." how do we do this? And I love the part of including more stakeholders because one of the things that we're seeing is we see this claim that competition undermines collaboration. 
Well, it may harm collaboration just between a couple incumbent interests and sort of like, as I would say, like the, the sort of like um, uh, the, the, the fiefdoms that they're in, <laughs> if you will. But once you start talking about the full set of stakeholder inputs that get involved, that's also the recipe for not just better planning processes, but also we're seeing that from a lot of the downstream fights on siting right now, where a lot of those interest groups are saying, hey, we wish we had more input up front in the process and expertise and our, our concerns were at least heard. So there's probably a better way to check a lot of boxes just by having that inclusiveness up front. Ari, it looked like you were going to say something. All right, well, I'm going to turn it over. Let's see, we have four minutes left, so maybe a rapid round. We have a, a, a question from Nora Brownell, which is, um, well, three, excuse me. Is there a role for DOE labs in validating planning uh, inputs? Of course, DOE is a new initiative that's, that's starting up here. Um, would performance-based metrics um, for transmission owners and RTOs lead to more accountability? Uh, and should a company that precludes competition to its own territory be allowed to participate in competitive processes elsewhere? I will let you each take one minute to answer what question you would like with that, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you. Well, I, I alluded to this before that, you know, the problem with transmission rates is that they encourage capital deployment and not operational excellence. And so you have utilities that say they're so committed to reliability, and I don't doubt that they are, but they also have this, they have this split focus where they also need to be deploying capital. And so there, to me, there's no real need for those jobs to be with the same company. You could have reliability focused utilities and kind of outsource the job of actually building all these projects to companies that are just explicitly focused uh, on that. And so, I mean, I think reforming rates in a very major way and, and harnessing competition can be part of that um, effort to really create entities that are completely focused uh, on reliability. So if, if there's something, if you want to call it performance-based rates, that's fine. But I, I just sort of think separating capital deployment from, from profits has got to be part of the discussion ultimately. Absolutely. Great point. And I think the grid enhancing technology stuff, of course, for me to move here on and what we call ambient or weather adjusted line ratings, which is really interesting. Uh, we're seeing a lot of advanced technologies that have a fraction of the cost, a fraction of the cost of conventional transmission that are completely sidelined right now. Um, so to Ari's point, whether that's an incentive-based approach or a little bit more of a forcing of best utility practices, there's got to be more ideas to have that conversation. But I want to make sure Cindy and Keith get a, a last word here. Um, I'll just say briefly that um, having weighted into the grid enhancing technologies and center process and being very um, positive about Debts, but really negative about the performance-based incentives that are being contemplated there. I'm a little leery of going the performance um, mechanism on the theory that it's very hard to have a consistent baseline. And if you don't have a uniform baseline, which is really hard in the United States um, with the myriad structures and owners, et cetera, I, 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 th I think that becomes very hard. So, um, you know, I, I think there certainly are ways to promote gets and better practices. Taps put a whole bunch of comments in that proceeding on what we should be doing, but not those incentives. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. And Keith, for the last word, take it away. And so I'll, I'll be brief and just say, I do think that there is a role of an independent transmission monitor. I think um, I think the model of the market monitor has proven to be very effective on the market side. I think we've, we've dabbled and other market monitors to varying degrees have, have been a part of these processes. And I think, um, I think we feel that we could, we could definitely, that we see op areas of opportunity <laughs> for market monitors or others to, to make an improvements and enhancements to the process, um, much in the way that we do with markets today. Thanks. Wonderful. Well, I wish we had uh, another week or so to really dig into this here, but um, thank you so much, everyone, for your contributions here, and thanks, everyone, for your, your questions. Um, feel free to, to shoot us feedback and, and ideas for follow-up work. I think there's a strong appetite um, to keep this dialogue going. So thank you all very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.